Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. There is an old definition which describes the theater as a plank on two barrels and a passion. Analogously, we might describe radio drama as a microphone, a voice, and a story. Tonight we have all three and little else. Little else is needed when the voice belongs to an actor of the statue of Herbert Marshall. We present him without supporting players, without sound effects, and no more than the usual musical trimmings. His voice is all that's needed to strike terror to your heart. So send the more impressionable small children out of the room, dim the lights, settle back and listen. As Mr. Marshall stars in A.M. Burridge's chilling story, The Waxwork, which begins in just a moment. Here's Frankie Lane. I never feel like singing with a bad cold. So I take wonderful four-way cold tablets to relieve my cold misery fast. Right. Tests of four leading cold tablets proved four-way fastest acting of all. Amazing four-way starts in minutes to relieve aches, pains, headache, reduce fever, calm, upset stomach. Also overcomes irregularity. So when you catch cold, take my advice. Take four-way cold tablets. It's the fast way to relieve those nasty cold miseries and feel better quickly. Four-way, 29 and 59 cents. Here's a word about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. To get rid of embarrassing dandruff in three minutes, change to Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Three minutes with Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep unsightly dandruff away forever. Apply Fitch before wetting hair. Rub in one minute. Add water. Lather one minute. Then rinse one minute. Every trace of dandruff goes down the drain. Three minutes with Fitch and embarrassing dandruff's gone. At the same time, Fitch can brighten hair up to 35%. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today. And now, The Waxwork, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. While the uniformed attendants of Mariner's Waxworks were ushering the last travelers through the exit... The manager sat in his office interviewing Raymond Houston, a young journalist, somewhat down in his luck. The manager was speaking. It used to be said years ago that Madame Tussauds would give a man a hundred pounds for sleeping alone in the Chamber of Horrors. I hope you don't think that we have made any such offer, Mr. Houston. By the way, what is your paper? I'm, I'm freelancing at present. However, I... I should find no difficulty in getting the story printed. The morning echo would use it like a shot. A night with mariner's murderers. Very well, Mr. Houston. I must warn you, it's no small ordeal that you're proposing to undertake. I own I shouldn't care to take it on. I should hate having to spend the night alone in the murderer's den. Why? Well... Those waxworks represent the lowest and most appalling types of humanity. The whole atmosphere of the place is unpleasant, and if you are susceptible to atmosphere, I warn you that you are in for a very uncomfortable night. Houston had known that from the moment the idea had first occurred to him. His soul sickened at the prospect. But here was a chance not to be missed. The price of a special story in the morning echo. Besides, if he wrote the story well, it might lead to an offer of regular employment. The manager smiled and rose. Well, I think the last of the people must have gone by now. Oh, um, one condition I'm afraid I must impose on you. I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare down there this evening. I don't know who gave the alarm, but whoever it was, it was a false one. Fortunately, there were very few people down there at the time, or there might have been a panic. And now, if you're ready, I'll take you down to the murderer's den. In a moment, we continue with the second act of Suspense. Here comes Elmer Blurt, world's lowest pressure salesman. Nobody home, I hope, I hope, I hope. It says here, J.P. Pullum, dentist. You wouldn't want to buy a new 1959 Rambler, would you, Doc? You are a lucky man. I just happen to have a vacancy. Uh, sit down. Yeah, but, Doc... Open wide. Uh, oh, that's right. You know, you don't have to sell me on the 59 Rambler. First in economy, first in sales gains, and no wonder. 
Rambler has the best of both. Big car room, small car economy. Yeah, but down. Oh, relax. Can't you salesmen ever stop selling? <laughs> you know, Rambler's got quite an idea with that personalized comfort. Independently adjustable front seats, adjustable headrests, easiest parking and handling in America. <laughs> well, that 59 Rambler is so terrific it makes you want to put your foot right down on the accelerator. <laughs> no, that didn't hurt, did it? Oh, gosh, Willikers, no. That's my lower plate you've been drilling. <laughs> Rambler continues to pass car after car in sales. In state after state, Rambler now outsells all but two other makes. Come see why. Drive the success car at your Rambler dealers. And now, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, Act Two of The Waxwork. Waxworks was an eerie and uncomfortable chamber. A chamber whose atmosphere invited its visitors to speak in whispers. The waxwork murderers stood on low pedestals. Recent notorieties rubbed dusty shoulders with the old favorites. Sertel, the murderer of Weir, stood as if frozen in the act of making a shop window gesture to young Bywaters. There was the Freud, the poor half-baked little snob who killed for gain so that he might ape the gentleman. Within a few yards of him sat Mrs. Thompson, that erotic romanticist, hanged to propitiate British middle-class matronhood. Charles Peace, the only member of the vile company who looked uncompromisingly and entirely evil, sneered across at Norman Thorne. The manager pointed out several of the more interesting of these unholy notabilities. That, um, that's Kriplin. I expect you recognize him. Insignificant little beast who looks as if he couldn't tread on a worm. That, uh, that is Armstrong. Looks like a decent, harmless country gentleman, doesn't he? There's old Vakie. You can't miss him, of course, because of his beard. And this one. Who's that? Houston asked in a whisper. Oh, have a good look at him. This is our star. He's the only one of the bunch that hasn't been hanged. The figure which Houston had indicated was that of a small, slight man, not much more than five feet in height. It wore little waxed moustaches, large spectacles, and an opera cape. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded Houston of a stage caricature. He could not have said precisely why the mild-looking face seemed to him so repellent. Who is he? That, said the manager, is Dr. Bourdet. Houston shook his head doubtfully. I, I, I think I've heard the name, but I forget in connection with what. Oh, you would remember better if you were a Frenchman. A little while back, that man was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day and of fruit cutting by night. He killed for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him to kill. And always in the same way. With a razor. But at last he left a clue behind him which set the police upon his track. But he was too clever for them. When he realized that the coils were closing about him, he mysteriously disappeared. And ever since, the police of every civilized country have been looking for him. However, there is no doubt that he managed to do away with himself. And by some means which has prevented his body coming to light. I... I don't like him at all. Ugh. What eyes he's got. Yes, this figure is a little masterpiece. You find the eyes bite into you? Well, that's excellent realism, then. For Bourdet practiced mesmerism and was supposed to hypnotize his victims before dispatching them. Indeed, had he not done so, it is impossible to see how so small a man could have accomplished his ghastly work. There were never any signs of a struggle. I... I, I thought I saw him move. Well, you will have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect, sir. I'm sorry I can't give you any more light, but all the lights are already on. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as gloomy as possible. 
Well, good night, Mr. Houston. The manager had provided an armchair for Houston, who immediately turned it so that his back was towards the effigy of Dr. Wardette. For some undefined reason, he liked Dr. Wardette a great deal less than his companions. The dim, unwavering light fell on the rows of figures which were so uncannily like human beings that the silence and the stillness seemed unnatural and even ghastly. He missed the sound of breathing, the rusting of clothes, the hundred and one minute noises one hears when even the deepest silence has fallen upon a crowd. And the air was as stagnant as water at the bottom of a standing pond. It must be like this at the bottom of the sea, he thought. He faced the sinister figures boldly enough. They were only waxworks. So long as he let that thought dominate all others, he promised himself that all would be well. It did not, however, save him long from the discomfort occasioned by the waxen stare of Dr. Moabet, which he knew was directed upon him from behind. The eyes of the little Frenchman's effigy haunted and tormented him, and he itched with a desire to turn and look. At last, the compulsion was too great, and he smoothed his chair around and looked behind him. The image of the dreadful little doctor seemed to stand out with a queer prominence. Hewson flinched before the parody of mildness which some fiendishly skilled craftsman had managed to convey in wax, met the eyes for an agonized second, and turned again to face the other direction. He is only a waxwork like the rest of you. You are all only waxworks. They were only waxworks, yes, but waxworks don't move. Not that he had seen the least movement anywhere, but it struck him that in the moment or two while he had looked behind him, there had been the least subtle change in the grouping of the figures in front. Crippin, for instance, seemed to have turned a degree to the left. Or, thought Hewson, perhaps the illusion was due to the fact that he had not returned his chair to its exact original position. He had neither seen nor heard a movement. But it was as if some sixth sense had made him aware of one. He looked straight into the vapid countenance of Lefroy, which smiled vacantly back as if to say, It wasn't I. Of course it wasn't he, or any of them. It was his own nerves. Or was it? He swung round quickly to encounter the mild but baleful stare of Dr. Gourdet. Then, without warning, he jerked his head back to stare straight at Crippen. Ah! He nearly caught Crippen that time. You'd better be careful, Crippen, and all the rest of you. If I do see one of you move, I'll smash you to pieces. Do you hear? This would not do. This distinctly would not do. These figures grouped around him were only dummies made of wax and sawdust. They stood there for the entertainment of morbid sightseers and orange sucking trippers. But it was no good. He knew the effigy of Dr. Bourdet was staring at him. He could feel the two places where the gaze of those piercing eyes pressed into his back. He turned halfway and tried to steal a glance at the figure. But instead he felt himself whirled around to face those dreadful hypnotic eyes. You moved. Yes, you did. You moved. I saw you. You moved. Then he sat quite still, staring straight before him like a man found frozen in the Arctic snows. Dr. Gourdet's movements were leisurely. He stepped off the pedestal with the mincing care of a lady alighting from a bus and then quietly sat down on the edge facing Houston. Bonsoir, monsieur. Something tells me that you are nervous. My dear sir, I have no illusions. I am not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Bourdet himself. In a moment, we continue with the third act of... 
suspense. Who do you know about the little white tablet in the little green pocket roll? Just a waiting for the moment when you need them to bring your acid indigestion under control. Tums are the little white tablets in the little green pocket roll. Tums for the tummy, T-U-M-S. Bring relief quicker than you'd ever guess. Best for any kind of acid distress. Keep them handy in the pocket roll. Keep your tummy under Tums control. Tums are fast, effective, and safe. Tums relieve the discomfort of acid indigestion quickly with no danger of acid rebound, sometimes caused by harsh alkalizers. Always carry Tums, 10 cents, three-roll pack a quarter. New Tums six-roll pack with free metal carrier, 49 cents. And now, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, Act Three of The Waxwork. Sat immobile, staring at the mild little murderer. He could see, he could hear, but he could not move a muscle, and he could not tear his eyes away from Dr. Bourdette's hypnotic eyes. The doctor continued in his easy manner. The circumstances have made it desirable that I should live in England. I was close to this building this evening when I saw a policeman regarding me a little too curiously. I guessed that he intended to follow and perhaps ask me embarrassing questions, so I mingled with the crowd and came in here. A coin brought my admission to the chamber in which we now meet, and an inspiration showed me a certain means of escape. I raised a cry of fire, and when all the fools had rushed to the stairs, I stripped my effigy of the cape which you behold me wearing, donned it, hid my effigy under the platform at the back, and took its place on the pedestal. The manager's description of me, which I had the embarrassment of being compelled to overhear, was biased, but not altogether inaccurate. Clearly, I am not dead, although it is as well that the world think I am. His account of my hobby, which I have indulged for years, although through necessity less frequently of late, was in the main true. For you see, the world is divided between collectors and non-collectors. But the non-collectors were not concerned. The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes, from money to cigarette cards, from mouths to matchboxes. I collect fruits. He paused again and regarded Houston's throat with interest mingled with disfavor. I am obliged to the chance which brought us together tonight, and perhaps it would seem ungrateful to complain. From motives of personal safety, my activities have been somewhat curtailed of late. I'm glad of this opportunity of gratifying my somewhat unusual whim. But you have a skinny neck, sir, if you will overlook a personal remark. I should never have selected you from choice. I like men with thick necks, thick red necks. He fumbled in an inside pocket and took out something which he tested against the wet forefinger and then proceeded to pass gently to and fro across the palm of his left hand. But this is a little French razor. The blade, you will observe, is very narrow. They do not cut very deep, but deep enough. In just one little moment, you shall see for yourself. I shall ask you the little civil question of all polite barbers. Does the razor suit you, sir? He rose up, a diminutive but menacing figure of evil, and approached Houston with the silent, furtive step of a hunting panther. 
You will have the goodness to raise your chin a little. Thank you. And a little more. Just a little more. Ah, thank you. Merci. Merci, monsieur. Merci, merci. chamber was a thick skylight of frosted glass which by day lit in a few sickly and filtered rays from the floor above. After sunrise, these began to mingle with the subdued light from the electric bulbs, and this mingled illumination added a certain ghastliness to a scene which needed no additional touch of horror. The waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places waiting to be admired or execrated by the crowds who would presently wander fearfully among them. In their midst, Houston sat still, leaning far back in his swivel chair. His chin was uptilted as if it were waiting to receive attention from a barber. And although there was not a scratch upon his throat, nor anywhere upon his body, he was cold, and dead. Dr. Baudet on his pedestal watched the dead man unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion. But then, after all, he was only a waxwork. Marshall starred in William N. Robeson's production of The Waxwork, written by A. M. Burridge, and adapted for radio by Mel Dinelli. In a moment, a word about next week's story of suspense. Do you have trouble getting your husband to talk frankly about the intimate and important things in your married life? All too often, a husband's reluctance to talk about sex, money, or the children can destroy a happy marriage. Be sure to read one woman's real-life solution to this problem in the new March issue of McCall's Magazine, now at your favorite newsstand. In all, you'll find more than 40 exciting features in this big new issue of McCall's. Read 15 practical down-to-earth ideas on how you can earn an extra $1,000 this year by doing just a few hours' work each week. Learn Debbie Reynolds' side of the strange divorce story that wrecked Hollywood's ideal marriage. And see many full-color photos previewing the newest styles and hairdos that women will be wearing this spring. Don't miss the fascinating March issue of McCall's with more than 40 exciting features for you and your family. Buy the new March McCall's at all newsstands now. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Myron McCormick in Mad Man of Manhattan. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The latest news follows. Then, have gun, will travel on the CBS radio network. <laughs>